support of of. It certainly wasn't uh, public service trade unions uh, that called for the creation of uh, all of those new agencies uh, over the past decade. As I say, it was largely driven by a theory that uh, agencies and small agencies uh, located in the particular provision of service uh, was a good thing. So we're now, if you like, going into a reversal mode in terms of a far more integrated public service. Uh, I myself think that the OECD report is a positive one in terms of it's moving away from that neoliberal new management theory towards uh, building on, if you like, the old values and ethos that were there in the public service, but also uh, very much focusing on value for money, which is proper, uh, that it showed no public uh, service union or, uh, will argue that uh, citizens are not entitled to value for money, uh, and it's also arguing for uh, a much greater focus on the citizens right, as an integrated concept rather than focusing on, on, on consumers. So in that respect, I think it's something uh, that we can, we can welcome. Now, that's, if you like, the positive side of what we've seen in the public service, and there's copies of these slides if anyone wants to, uh, to pick them up uh, later on. Uh, I'd argue that the failures in terms of public service uh, have been failures of, uh, of policy uh, and probably failures of, uh, of policy advice. Uh, in essence, in Ireland, we all know in terms of the international crisis, it, it was a crisis of the, in particular, the neoliberal uh, model of capitalism. This idea that the financial sector is in itself uh, an added value, is in itself a sustainable, uh, if you like, driver of growth. That turned out, uh, as we now know, uh, to uh, be completely wrong. And in fact, the uh, unregulated financial sector in internationally uh, was uh, a problem, a systemic problem uh, that was waiting to happen. It probably took 25 years before uh, that problem uh, came, uh, came to fruition. In Ireland, it's been an excessive uh, adherence to the neoliberal model uh, that has largely caused uh, the uh, catastrophic failure we now have uh, within, uh, within our economy. And if you go back to uh, the problem in the uh, property sector, house prices, uh, I don't believe uh, the idea that somehow everything was fine up to 2003, 2004, 2005, and that if only things had sort of scaled back then, uh, that everything uh, would have been fine. If you look at house prices between 87 and 2007, uh, in that first decade they increased by 140%. In the second decade, between 97 and 2007, they increased by 241%. That additional 100% in those two decades all happened in a three-year period between 97, 98 and 99. House prices were going up by 26, 32, 20%, a cumulative increase of 99%. Uh, so in my view, uh, it's clear that the problem right, stemmed from the wrong policy response to that particular uh, crisis back uh, in the three-year period between 97 uh, and, and 2000. And it wasn't as if people didn't point that out at the time. Uh, I was constantly on Morning Ireland with David Hanley because he had a particular interest in, uh, in house prices, uh, warning of the dangers. Ourselves in CPSU and SIPDU produced a joint report back in 1999, warning of the consequences. Right? of the rise in house prices for, for, for the economy, demanding action on the demand side, right, to curb uh, the excessive growth in, in, in house prices, and arguing that the idea that uh, it was supply uh, and the solutions were on the supply side was fundamentally wrong and fundamentally uh, mistaken. Uh, and in my view, uh, the genesis of our property bubble uh, stems from that period. Uh, house prices went on an upward trajectory uh, that was unstoppable because the policy response was simply on the supply side. It was supply, 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 keep building more houses. Uh, and again, classic neoliberal uh, theory, right? But again, classically wrong uh, in this case in terms of, uh, of uh, what, what, what actually happened. And as I say, it wasn't as if there weren't people uh, warning of the consequences in terms of what was happening at the time. There were. And our, ourselves and SIP2 in particular can take credit for warning uh, about what happened. My other uh, argument is that the second 
major policy failure uh, that took place uh, again at the earlier part of the decade was the response to euro membership when we joined the single currency uh, in 1999. And certainly if you looked at uh, the uh, approach uh, that was taken uh, before we joined the single currency, the general expectation was we would have to exist in a low inflation environment, that that was what was uh, likely to be uh, the foreseeable future. And we had negotiated wage increases in the, in the 90s uh, that were generally uh, geared towards a low inflation environment. But yet when we joined the currency uh, in the beginning of uh, 1999, in July of that year, inflation was 1.2%. Within 18 months, inflation had gone to 7%. Now that wasn't anything on the trade union side in terms of demanding uh, bigger uh, wage increases. Yes, it's true to say there was a, a feeling given the rise in house prices uh, that there was a necessity for, if you like, a dividend from the Celtic Tiger, uh, tiger phase. Uh, but uh, when the programme for prosperity and fairness was negotiated uh, back in uh, early 2000, uh, it was done in an environment where inflation at that stage was already uh, running at, at, at 4%. Now, I don't buy the idea right, that the inflation uh, increase in that period was due to the weakness of the euro compared to the dollar and sterling. Uh, okay, that was a factor, right? But it was very clear in terms of the whole approach to economic policy in terms of uh, house prices, in terms of uh, massive increase in terms of uh, public spending, uh, that in essence, domestically, uh, we built uh, a high... Uh, inflation environment uh, and built that into the economy uh, at, uh, at, at, at that time. And the irony is that uh, had uh, the punt been there as a, if you like, separate currency, the markets would not have allowed that to happen. But it was, if you like, the, the, the lack of market discipline uh, that was there uh, in terms of euro membership. Uh, and I'm not arguing, by the way, right, that Euro membership was the wrong thing. I think it was fundamentally the right thing for the, for the country and the economy in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, its, uh, its, its future development. The problem was that the excessive neoliberal economic mentality, right, primarily in the mindset of Charlie McCreevy, and uh, I, it's quite interesting, right, that Charlie McCreevy has not to a large extent yet uh, been identified right, as uh, the person who got the economic policy wrong. In, in large measure it's seen as Brian Cowan's mistake. Right? Uh, I don't think that's correct. I think the fundamental economic policies that have uh, driven this country uh, to the crisis and catastrophe we're in uh, dates back to the late uh, that latter part uh, of the last uh, decade and the earlier part uh, and the earlier part of this decade. And, the problem was, uh, it was a view that the success of the low corporation tax model uh, could transfer uh, to uh, income tax and also the capital gains tax. Charlie McCreevy's uh, famous uh, comment that by having capital gains tax, he increased the capital gains tax take, which of course he did, but again, it was in the short term because it was all creating uh, a bubble that took 10 years before it actually, uh, actually uh, burst. And it was this widespread view that the fundamentals of the Irish economy were superior to that of uh, our European partners. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's no wonder that in that period uh, we did have a rise in Euroscepticism uh, across broad sections of, of Irish society, including in the trade union movement, that uh, I have to say it was a surprise to me that the broad uh, Euro, uh, if you like, support that was there in the trade union movement uh, in the late 70s and into the 80s and 90s uh, became very fractured uh, in, in, in the recent decade and uh, it's really been a question right of you know the argument right that being closer to Boston rather than Berlin uh, I, that, I think unfortunately that had its impact too uh, within the broad uh, trade union movement I just want to say something about pay policy in the public sector because, again, uh, and it's noticeable that what the chairman was introducing it that you know, the first response to the crisis back in uh, the autumn of 2008 uh, was to attack the public sector and attack the public, uh, public servants in particular. And I'm always struck by Dermot Gleeson's comments at the Ken Mayor Forum uh, in October 2008 when uh, he attacked the public service uh, for a lack of competition, as he called it. Uh, in, in the public service. Now, well, we could well have done 
uh, without uh, some of the competition uh, that was done in, in the banking sector and partly contributed uh, to the mess we're in. But also benchmarking has been identified as, if you like, part of the problem uh, that uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the public service. And you know, the difference is this, right? Benchmarking became a name for uh, public service uh, catch-up pay agreements, right? Uh, and it became easy to attack because it had uh, a single name. But in fact, the first uh, program back in 1987 that was responsible for the recovery in the Irish economy had provision for what uh, were benchmarking agreements, though they weren't called uh, that at the time. Usually every five to seven years since the 60s, uh, public service pay is compared uh, to the private sector and, uh, ri and uh, rises uh, as a result of that. And again, going back to the 2000 period, I mean, it was quite noticeable that generally, uh, over the period of the 90s, about 500 clerical officers were recruited uh, into the civil service every year. That was a pretty standard, right? It could, you know, maybe 450, maybe 550, but of that order, in terms of the turnover of staff, you had about 500 clerical officers recruited every year. In 2001, there were 2,200 clerical officers recruited uh, into the civil service. People were leaving in droves for better uh, wages in the private sector, uh, and those wages were not being driven by trade union negotiations, but by driven purely by labour market conditions in terms of labour market shortages that were there at the time. Again, it was all part of the unsustainable bubble uh, that uh, uh, happened around that time. And in fact, benchmarking uh, in 2001 uh, put an end to what were traditionally seen as uh, uh, leapfrogging claims uh, in, in, in the public sector. There have been increases in staffing uh, in uh, the public service uh, over the past decade. There will be retrenchment uh, in those numbers over uh, the next four to five years. Uh, we do have guarantees about no compulsory redundancy, uh, but there is a moratorium and jobs are not being filled uh, in the public service in the way in which they, uh, they were. So some of that increase uh, will we'll scale back. You can see that it's largely been in the health sector and in the education sector where the need for improvements and frontline provision is great as civil service. It hasn't been uh, an increase to any huge extent and where it has been, it's largely been at the top right, rather than uh, at, at the, uh, the basic, if you like, uh, frontline public service provision in the civil service which is done by clerical officers, staff officers and the executive officers, uh, it's largely been at the senior management grades that the increases uh, have, uh, have come. So just in conclusion then, I have to say yes, there has been growth in numbers in the public service, uh, but from a low base. Uh, yes, there were facilitated by the windfall taxes and insofar as uh, they're gone and the economy is in a different, different space now, there will be uh, significant uh, retrenchment is a reality for us over the next number of years. I'd argue that better service delivery for citizens has taken place uh, over the last uh, uh, past 15 years or so uh, and you know we've had fragmentation of public service which has been a waste uh, and a duplication of resources but in my view uh, the real failure in public services uh, has not been your ordinary uh, hard-working uh, public servants, whether in the uh, civil service, like your clerical offices, your executive offices, in the uh, health sector, your nurse, uh, uh, the teacher, uh, or the guard, it has largely been in the area of uh, professionals and policy advice. Uh, and I'd, I'd argue that there is a lack of accountability uh, in, in, in our society, and a lack of accountability uh, that needs to be addressed. Certainly, if you look at some of the things we've seen in the papers in recent times, the idea that the professions right, uh, simply can regulate themselves uh, in, in some parts of the public service, uh, I think that displays uh, a lack of accountability, uh, a lack of accountability, a white collar uh, lack of accountability, if you like. If you look at the failures that have taken place in banking and regu regulation, and yet uh, nobody uh, in terms of uh, those areas has yet been held uh, to account either in the regulation of banks or in the banks themselves. And ultimately, the politicians will be held to account by the electorate. There's no question about that. So you know, ultimately, uh, the political failures uh, will have consequences in terms of the electorate 
uh, visiting their vengeance on the politicians who were responsible for it. But there's also, in my view, a need for accountability in terms of uh, the senior public service. I mean, Ken Whittaker was rightly given credit for uh, his contribution uh, to embarking this country away from the import substitution strategy uh, of the 30s and 40s to the, if you like, uh, more open free trade uh, approach uh, of, of the late 50s and rightly gets the credit for that. But equally in terms of the policy advice uh, that the ministers uh, acted on, uh, we need to have a greater degree of transparency uh, and information. Now perhaps uh, the ministers acted contrary to the advice uh, of the senior civil service. Uh, we don't know that, right? Uh, but if they didn't, right, and we need, we need transparency in that point, well, I think the senior civil servants also need to be held to account uh, within our society. So, in summary, I'm saying public service overall, your ordinary public servants, has delivered in the past uh, decade. Uh, the problem has been in terms of a lack, account a lack of accountability uh, for the elites in our society and for certain professional groups. Thank you very much. Thank you.